morning to all of you here in Axis. So good to see all friends here. And hello to those of you who are joining us online and also those who are from the regional centres in the northeast, in the east and the west. I also want to welcome back those of you who came for our Easter services last weekend. And if you are joining us for the very first time today, let me extend a special warm welcome to you. Thank you for taking time to be with us this morning. So today we are starting a two-part sermon series on family. And family is something that's very close to our heart because all of us, we come from family. And every year we'll devote at least one sermon series to talk about family because we recognize the importance of having strong family. Family is instituted by God and it's the basic building block of every society. And if a nation wants to be strong, then the the families in the, in the nation has to be strong as well. And over the recent years, we have seen the family unit come under attacks as there are various challenges that seek to redefine how a marriage or a family should look like in a family. And as a church, it's important for us to be intentional to build our marriages strong, to be intentional to build our family strong so that we are able to show the world that God's institution of family and marriages are good for the society. So in this two-part sermon series called Faith for the Generations, we're going to look at how we can impart and pass on our faith to the next generations so that they can in turn influence the future generations that is after them. While we understand that parents have the primary responsibility to impart faith and pass on their faith to their children. This sermon series is not just for parents. So those of you who are not parents, please don't fall asleep, okay? Because as a church, fam as a church we are one big spiritual family. And we all of us, we have a part to play to raise the next generation and to help our parents thrive in their parenting. So this is something that all of us must come together to do. So it's not just for parents, it's not just the responsibilities of Hope Kids teachers, it's not just the responsibilities of our students' leaders, but all of us have to come together to work together if we want to raise a stronger next generation. And at the beginning of this year, Pastor Jeff shared with us that one of the strategic goals for our church this year is we want to see a growth in youth. While we can do that by reaching out to the youth out there who have not yet come to know Jesus, we mustn't forget that we have a group of youth who grow up in the church. Many parents, many Christian parents, we assume that as long as we bring our children to the, to the Sunday school, to connect them with the children's church and then make sure that they, con they are connected to the youth ministry, then our children will turn out fine in their faith. But according to a survey done in 2019 by US Christian Research Group, Barna, it shows that 64% or almost two-thirds of young people who grew up in the church drop out of church when they become adults. 64% or two, almost two-thirds of young people who grew up in the church drop out of the church when they become adults. While we do not have stats for Singapore churches, the US data should give us a good indication of what to expect here in Singapore. There are various reasons for the dropout, and we don't have time to go through it here. But as a church, we can admit that there are things that we have not done well in. And if we want to reverse this trend, we have to turn to God. You know, as parents, we should also confess that even though we know in our head that we have to pass our faith to our next generation, to our children, but in reality, not many of us may put emphasis into doing that. I know that parenting can be a challenging journey. You know, while parents can prepare for this challenging journey by reading all kinds of parenting books that are out there, one of the fundamental questions that Christian parents will have to answer is this. What kind of people does God want our children to be? What kind of people does God want our children to be? Because the answer to that question will determine how you bring up your children. 
Many times, Christian parents tend to raise our children according to what we want them to be instead of what God wants them to be. We tend to approach parenting with a, a sense of ownership, thinking that these are our children and their obedience is our right. And this paves the way for us to find our identity in our children. We start to, to expect them to become what we want them to be so that we can feel a sense of achievement, so that we can feel a sense of success. We begin to look at our children as trophies, as our trophies, instead of seeing them as God's creation. And as a parent myself, there were times in my life where, where I was tempted to even think like that as well. It is so easy for parents to lose sight of the, to, uh, to lose sight of the fact that these children actually do not belong to us. These children belong to God and God has given them to us for us to steward them for a season, not to bring us glory, but to bring glory to God. So in order for us to raise our children according to what God wants them to be, we need more than knowledge that comes from parenting books. But more importantly, we need wisdom that can only come from God and His Word. So instead of just following all the steps and all the processes uh, and all the methods in all these parenting books, and then starting to feel stress and guilty when our child does not turn out as expected, we need to learn to rest in the grace and the wisdom of God. As parents, we need to know that our God loves our children more than we can ever love them. That our God wants our children to have a relationship with Him, to spend eternity with Him. So we need to place our trust in God. So today, let's turn to Scripture to instruct us. The passage of Scripture that we are looking at today is from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1 to verse 3. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1 to verse 3. And the title of my message today is Taking God Seriously. Taking God Seriously. So let us read these three verses from Deuteronomy chapter 6 together in one voice. So on the count of three. Are you ready? One, two, three. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God, as long as you live by keeping all His decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Let's commit this time to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you that we are able to gather here in a setting like this to listen to your word. Lord, I pray that you open up our hearts and speak to us through your words today. And Lord, may you anoint my lips so that I can speak forth your word. Lord, we commit this time of learning into your hands and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me start by providing us with uh, some background information to the book of Deuteronomy so that we are able to understand this passage in this context. The word Deuteronomy comes from the Greek word that means repeated law, or a copy of the law. It is the last of the five books written by Moses. And Moses delivered this message to the Israelites on the plains of Moab after their 40 years in the wilderness. So he delivered this message to a new generation of Israelites who were preparing to cross the river Jordan to enter into the promised land that God has promised to their ancestors. And Moses didn't want them to repeat the mistakes of their parents who rebelled against God and who were all perished in the wilderness. That's why Moses took time to explain God's law to them so that they will know that God's law is the way to life so that they are able to renew their commitment with God and by obeying Him. So after reminding the Israelites on how God took their ancestors out of Egypt and took care of them throughout the 40 years in the wilderness, Moses went on in chapter 5 and chapter 6 to expound on the Ten Commandments and also to explain its implications to them. 
So Moses wanted to, them to know that God's commands are the way to life. And even as they prepare to enter into a new land with corrupt practice as well as new challenges, they are not to forget that they belong to the, to the one true God and they should not be following the ways of the people of the land. So if the nation of Israel, if they can continue to honour God and to treat God as their first priority and their final authority, then they will continue to enjoy God's blessing in the promised land. Now today we are living in the 21st century and we are seeing new generations, the millennial generations, the Gen Z generation, the, the Gen Alpha, that are quite different from previous generations. And these generations are facing new unprecedented social and cultural changes. And some of these changes, such as the impact of social media, such as uh, sexuality and gender issues, and postmodern worldview, it poses a serious challenge to the Christian faith. And it's becoming increasingly difficult for us to share our faith and to live out our faith in this world. But despite all these challenges, God's plan for the world has not changed. God is still working in His people. God is still working through His people to bring about His redemption plan for the whole world. So as a church, how can we build up the next generation and equip them so that they can remain committed in their faith? How can we as parents, impart and, and pass on our faith to the next generation so that they can take God seriously and obey God courageously in the face of all these new challenges. There are two things that we can learn in the passage of Scripture here. So in order for the future generations to remain committed to God and to take God seriously, first of all, we must take God's instruction seriously. It starts with us. We must take God's instruction seriously. From verse 1 to verse, uh, first part of verse 3, it says, These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God so long, as long as, they, as you live by keeping all His decrees and commands that I give you. So from verse 1 here, Moses is exhorting the Israelites to keep God's laws, commands and decrees that God commanded Moses to teach them. So Moses is concerned that as the Israelites enter into the new land, they will forget about their commitment to God as they start to follow all these pagan practices. So he exhorts them to obey God's instructions that were given to them to set them apart to set them apart from the people of the land. So to Moses, his responsibility is not just in conveying God's instructions to his people, but God's revelation demands a response from his people. And Moses here is challenging the Israelites to take God's commands seriously and to even be able to pass on these commands to their children and as well as their grandchildren. And if they are able to do that, then as a nation, they will continue to enjoy God's blessing and that they will, they will be able to remain in the promised land for a long time. Moses' goal here is for the people to cultivate a lifelong fear of the Lord. For the people to cultivate a lifelong fear of the Lord. Now, when we see the word fear, Many times we associate it with something that's terrible, something that's unpleasant, that we want to run away from or we want to fight to get out of it. But that is not what the fear of the Lord is. The fear of the Lord is the reverential awe that, of God that, that grips our heart. The fear of the Lord is something that causes us to want to respect God's authority, to want to view, to want to acknowledge, to want to treat God with the utmost carefulness. The fear of the Lord causes us to come to this realization on how great and how awesome our Creator God is and how small we are. It compels us to want to listen to God. It compels us to surrender to His will. 
that we are able to trust and rest in the grace, in God's grace. So the fear of the Lord is not a fear that cripples us, but the fear of the Lord is a fear that inspires us to want to obey God's command. And God's desire is not for us to fear Him only when He manifests His glory. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 23 to verse 26, we read about how the people of Israel, they had an encounter with God on Mount Sinai when God spoke to them. And the scene was really awesome. There was fire on top of the mountain. There was a, a cloud. And then there was thick darkness. And then God spoke in the booming loud voice, Thou shall not have any other gods before me. No, it created such an impression on the Israelites that they pleaded with Moses to not have God speak so directly to them again. This is what the fear of God is. But sadly for the Israelites, the fear of the God, their, their fear of the Lord is short-lived. It did not last long. They soon became complacent. They soon became forgetful. And they started to complain and grumble against God and they rebelled against God. And that's why God told Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 29, that He desires for His people to always fear God and obey His commands so that you will go well with them and their children forever. This is what the verse says. It says, Oh, that their hearts will be inclined to fear me and keep my commands always. The key word here is always. So that it might go well with them and their children forever. And then Moses went on in the first part of verse 3 to exhort the nation of Israel to, to listen and be careful to obey God's command. The Hebrew word for the word here in verse 3 is the word Shema. It's also the same word used in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 in the famous Shema prayer. It goes like this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So the word Shema here does not just mean listen. It means to listen carefully. It means to listen attentively, to absorb it, and then to carry it out. So basically, in these first three verses, Moses here is, is instructing the Israelites to always fear God, to always take God seriously by obeying and taking His commands seriously. You know, friends, before we can even talk about passing on our faith to the next generation, we have to first take a look at ourselves and ask ourselves this honest question. Are we genuine Christ followers who take God and His instructions seriously? You know, taking God seriously starts with having a reverential fear of God that motivates us to want to obey and take His instruction seriously. How do we view God in our life? Do we only see God as a God who is loving, who is gracious? Or do we also see God as a God who is holy, who is righteous, who is just, who takes sin very seriously? When we truly comprehend how majestic and how awesome our God is, we will start to understand how great how deep, how wide the love and the grace of God really is. You know, the grace of God is so lavish that it allows sinners like us to approach the throne of grace without being consumed by God's wrath. And this is not something that we should take it for granted because we can only do this through the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. That is, it is because of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross that took away our sin, that Jesus gave us His perfect righteousness, that we are able to come before this awesome God, clothed with the righteousness of Jesus. And if you truly understand what a great privilege this is, then the only right response is to fear God and to obey Him. 
we become conscious of the presence of God in our daily lives and we give Him the reverence that only He alone deserves. No, taking God seriously comes with an understanding of who God is and His expectation for His people. And God has already made all these things clear in His words. That's why it's important for us to read God's Word, to understand God's Word before we can obey God's Word. You know, we are living in a world with a lot, a lot of distractions. And if we are not intentional to spend time to read God's Word, to understand God's Word, then noises from our work, noises from our Netflix, from our entertainment, our entertainment system, noises from our social media feeds will drown out God's voice. And it becomes even more challenging for parents who are already have so many other tasks on their hands. But if we don't take time to read and understand God's Word, we can't teach them to the next generation. According to surveys done by Whole Life Singapore from 2016 to 2020, this survey was done across some churches in Singapore. It shows that 72% of youth with Christian parents has never read or studied the Bible with their parents. 52% has never prayed or worshipped with their parents. Let's take a look at the other side of the stats from the parents' point of view. 50% of Christian parents with young children or teenagers have, have, has never read or studied the Bible with their children. And 30% has never prayed or worshipped with their children. Parents and friends, if we, want, if we really, really want to make a strong impact in the next generation, we need to show our children that we are serious about God, that we are serious about God's Word by reading and studying the Bible with them. Taking God's instruction seriously is more than just reading God's Word. It means that we, we take time to ponder, we take time to reflect, to to internalize God's Word so that we are able to obey God's Word wholeheartedly and also to live out our faith in our daily lives. Do we only behave like a Christian when we come to church, when we come for life group? Is our faith even visible throughout the rest of our week and even behind the closed, closed doors of our homes? You know, our children live with us. They see the best and the worst of us. Do our lives behind closed doors? The things that we say at home, the decision that we make, communicate to our children that we are serious about God and we are serious about His Word. What I'm not saying here is that as parents, we have to be perfect but we have to demonstrate to our children that we are people who are willing to take responsibility for our mistakes. You know, as I was preparing for this sermon series, I did a survey among all our student congregations to find out about their families. So I asked them a series of questions and I would like to share some of these findings with all of us. So I asked them this question, what are some things that you wish your parents would communicate with you more? And out of close to 300 responses, the majority indicated that they wish that their parents would communicate to them how they would also sometimes make mistakes. I also asked them a question on how they would describe their parents. The top three responses, they see their parents, first of all, as distant, overly protective, and hypocrites. Parents, let's take a good look at this data. This is how our children feel about us. We don't have to hide our mistakes. We don't have to try so hard to hide our mistakes. Our children know that we are imperfect. They see our mistakes. 
What they are looking for are parents who can connect with them by being real, by being authentic. Instead of trying to brush aside our mistakes, we model grace to our children when we can come before them and admit to them our mistakes and our weaknesses. When we pray together with them, when we ask them to forgive us, when we pray and ask God to help us, we are modeling to them the gospel because we are showing them that we are also people who have messed up in our life and that is why we need a savior. We need God's grace in our life. Christian author and pastor Paul Tripp says this in one of his books. He says that no parents give mercy better than the one who is convinced that he desperately needs it himself. And another area that we parents have to, have to take God's instruction seriously is in the area of our marriage. In the same survey done with the students, out of 100 students that come from Christian families whereby both parents are believers, 24% or close to one quarter indicated that their parents' marriage does not model what a good marriage should look like. In fact, there's another, quite a big proportion of them who are not so convinced that their parents' marriage model to them what a good marriage should look like. You know, while our marriages are not perfect, we should work to keep our marriages healthy. Christian best-selling author Jackie Bledsoe says that your marriage is the gospel you are preaching to your children. Your marriage is the gospel you are preaching to your children. God's Word teaches us that every Christian marriage should reflect the relationship between Christ and the church. That means when our children look at us, look at our marriage, they should be able to see Christ's sacrificial love and as well as the church trusting submission. They may not be able to see the full, full thing, but they should catch a glimpse of Christ's sacrificial love and the church trusting submission when they observe how we treat and relate to our spouse. For some of us, we may have neglected our marriages when the children come along because our focus and attention are all on the kids. And for some of us, our marriages may have become functional or even broken because of years of unresolved conflicts and years of broken a breakdown in the communication. And if you are in such a situation, I would like to encourage you to take steps to revive your marriage. As we talk about the focus for the year, about hearts on fire, as God revive our hearts, as God set our hearts on fire, we should also revive our marriages. God can heal our brokenness and God can bring restoration to our marriages. It can start as simple as spending intentional time to connect with our spouse, to talk to them without the kids. And as a, as a church, we want to help you get started. We have a three-day, two-night marriage retreat coming in July, on the 13th to 15th of July. And this is a time whereby you can have heart-to-heart -heart talks with your spouse without the children around. And this will be an opportunity for you to renew your marriage vows with your spouse as well. So you can register for this retreat at our Grow Portal and start to make childcare plans for your children so that you are able to attend this retreat. Let's build and invest our, in our marriage so that our marriages can reflect God's glory and can also be an encouragement to the next generation, to our children. You know, for those of you who are not married, for those of you who are not parents, we also have to follow, we also have to take God's instruction 
seriously. Because the next generation is not just watching their parents, but the next generation is watching the whole church community. And we model for them how we take God's word seriously by obeying all of God's commands. Do you read and obey the whole scripture? Or do you selectively choose passages that you like and reject passages that you don't like? You know, do you compromise on what you know is true so that you are able to fit in with your friends who are non-Christians? Do you enter into a BGR in a very casual manner, getting in and out of relationship in a very casual way? Or do you seek to understand what is God's design for marriage, what is God's design for sexuality before you enter into a relationship? Do you obey God even in difficult situations? Because if you only obey God when things are easy, then you really don't need much faith to trust God. But it's when we continue to hold on to God, when we continue to want to honour God and obey God when the situation gets difficult, that we are showing to the next generation how real God is to us. So friends, let's take God seriously by taking His instructions seriously. Not only do we have to know the Word of God, but we have to ponder, we have to reflect, we have to internalise God's Word so that we are able to obey God even when the situation is difficult. Always keep our hearts soft and contrite for God so that we are able to cultivate a lifelong fear of the Lord. Let our obedience be a testimony to the next generation so that they can learn to fear God and to take His instructions seriously. So besides taking God's instructions seriously, we can take God seriously by taking God's promise seriously seriously. This is the second thing that we can learn. Taking, take, God's instruction, take God's promise seriously. In the second part of verse 3, it says that you may increase greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. So as Moses exhorted the Israelites to, to listen and to obey God's word, he shares with them, that the purpose is for the people to flourish in their well-being and to multiply their descendants just as God has promised them. So in Genesis, God promised Abraham that he will bless and multiply Abraham and his descendants. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 17, it says, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. So Moses here described the promised land as a land flowing with milk and honey. Now milk is a product of herds, while honey is a natural resource. The honey here probably refers to syrup that comes from dates rather than honey that comes from bee. So we have before us a picture of the promised land. It is a land bursting with natural resources. It's a land bursting with cultural, uh, uh, cultivated produce. So the richness of this promised land represents the fullness of God's blessing that comes with the fulfilment of His promise for His people. It's a huge contrast to the harsh condition in the wilderness when all they had to eat was manna for 40 years. So, God is, so Moses here is reminding the people that as long as they remain committed to God, as long as they obey God, they can count on God to fulfill His promise to bless them. So besides taking God's instruction seriously, we need to take God seriously by taking His promise seriously. We are all spiritual descendants of Abraham and God will bless us so that we can be a blessing to the nations. And in John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus told us that He has come to give us an abundant life. Now, this abundant life is not about material abundance, though God can certainly bless us materially. But this abundant life is referring to spiritual abundance, whereby we get to enjoy this relationship with our Creator God. We get to enjoy this relationship with a God who will never leave us nor forsake us. Now, the Bible tells us 
that this relationship with God, that this kind of life is eternal life. Eternal life does not start only when we die and we, when, when we leave this earth. But eternal life has already started the moment you place your trust in Jesus and decided to follow Jesus. And the day will come when we can experience the fullness of this abundant life when Jesus comes again. And this should be something that we should be yearning and looking forward to. And we know that God will fulfill His promise because God is a promise keeper. Even though we are unable to experience the fullness of this abundant life right now, we should still be able to have a taste of what this abundant life looks like. So what is this abundant life all about? You know, it is a, it is, this abundant life is a blessed life whereby we take delight and joy in the presence of Jesus as His Spirit dwells within us. You know, this abundant life is a blessed life whereby we can rest in the completed work of Jesus knowing that we no longer have to strive to earn man's approval or to earn God's approval. This abundant life is the blessed life whereby we can trust that God satisfies us fully and that God is all that we'll ever need. And this abundant life is a blessed life whereby our intimacy with Jesus causes our heart to overflow with love, with joy, with the peace, with the kindness and generosity that can only come from Jesus. And if you are a Christ follower, you should already be experiencing this abundant life. And you should be looking forward and yearning to the day whereby you're able to experience the fullness of this abundant life. While every Christian knows the promise of eternal life. Not all of us always live with eternity in mind. Because if we, if we really believe in God's promise and take it seriously, then it should change the way how we view, how we respond to everything in life, including our parenting. As parents, we sometimes approach parenting as if our life here on earth is all that matters. Our parenting is rooted in the fear that our children will not be able to make it in life. So in order to prepare our children to succeed in life, we tend to focus on their academic, on their athletic, on their social development, more than their spiritual development. And over time, we begin to center or revolve our, our lives around our children. And our priorities and our values start to center around what we think is best for our children. Our participation in life group, in worship services, in ministry, takes a lower priority to make rooms for tuition, to make rooms for enrichment classes, to make room for sports, to make room for exam preparations. While I'm not saying that it's wrong to do that, it cannot be at the expense of neglecting the spiritual development and the spiritual formation of our children. Instead of just focusing on the progress of our children in school. As parents, as spiritual parents, as Christian parents, we need to also take an interest in the spiritual development of our children. Do you pray with your children? Do you read the Bible with your children? Do you worship together with them? Do you engage in spiritual conversation with them and do you find out what they are learning in church? Our children have to know that there are other things that matter in life other than academic success and achievement. And as parents, we should be more concerned about where our children will be spending their eternity rather than what they can achieve here on this earth. Let me say it again. As parents, we should be more concerned about where our children will be spending their eternity than where 
than what they can achieve here on this earth. No, we live in a world whereby people constantly tell us that in order to have a good life, you need to have the latest gadgets, you need to have good grades, you need to have a high paying jobs, you need to have a nice big house, you need to go on overseas vacations a few times a, a, a year. You need to have the latest entertainment system at your home. You need to have a fast sports car. You know, after a while, such things even appear in our conversation in church. When we talk to our friends in church, when we talk to them about our aspirations and our desires in life. And if you are not careful, we can start to take things, these things seriously. Thinking that these are things that are really good for us and we need them for our life. You know, while such things are not necessarily evil in themselves, there is more to life than them. Scripture teaches us that material things and comfort cannot satisfy us fully. That only true joy and fulfillment can only come from God. You know, when we have truly tasted the goodness of God, when we have truly experienced a glimpse of this abundant life that Jesus promised to us, then let's not exchange God's eternal promise for what the world is telling us is best for us and our children. Let me say it again. If you have truly tasted the goodness of Jesus, you have truly have a glimpse of this abundant life that Jesus promised, then let's not exchange what Let's not exchange God's eternal promise for what the world is telling is best for us and our children. You know, as a church, let's encourage one another to pursue God more than we pursue things of this world. Do you desire to have, do you desire to have more of Jesus in your life? Do you desire to have more of the presence of Jesus in you? Do you desire to have more of this abundant life that Jesus talked about? Do you place your hope in Jesus and His promise of abundant life? Or are you so focused on your anxieties, on your worries, on your fears, that you have lost sight of what God has promised to you? You know, friends, life on earth is too short for us to worry about things that do not matter for eternity. And Jesus is inviting you today to come to Him, to surrender your fears to Him, to surrender your anxieties to Him, to surrender your worries to Him, and to put your trust in Jesus and to allow Jesus to lead you and to guide you to his promise of abundant life. Don't give up. Don't lose hope. Even when you go through the toughest season of your life, continue to hold on to the hope. Continue to hold on to Jesus. Continue to persevere on as we trust in Jesus to lead us to what he has promised for us. And when our children, when the next generation see how real God is to us as we take God's promise seriously and faithfully. Then it paves the way for them to discover how real God can be to them. You know, friends, God has given us this sacred mission of making His redemption plan known to the world. And this, in, this includes imparting and passing on our faith to the next generation so that they can in turn influence the generations after them. And the cost of not doing this or the cost of doing this half-heartedly is just too high. Moses witnessed for himself with his own eyes how an entire generation perished in the wilderness because of their disobedience and their unfaithfulness to God. And Moses, he wrote the book of Deuteronomy to warn the people, the new generation of Israelites, as well as to warn future generations like us 
not to repeat the same mistakes. You know, the key to passing on our faith to the next generation is not about knowing what to do or what not to do. But the key to passing on our faith to the next generation is about that authenticity of our faith. It's about our commitment to our God. And it starts with us taking God seriously and obeying Jesus wholeheartedly. At the end of the day, we can never pass on a faith that we do not have. Neither can we force our faith upon our children. But we can demonstrate to them our commitment to a God who rules our heart. When we model how we cultivate a lifelong fear of God through our wholehearted obedience to Jesus, we are teaching the next generation to take God's instruction seriously. When we demonstrate how we continue to count on Jesus to fulfill His promise of abundant life, even through the darkest seasons of our life, we are encouraging the next generation to take God's promise seriously. And even as we do this faithfully, it is not a special formula that will get our children to follow Jesus. The truth is, our children will ultimately have to make their own decision to follow Jesus. And as parents, we do not have to feel guilty for their decision. If you have not done your part to point them to Jesus when they were young, either by teaching them or being a good role model to them, let's come before God in repentance and ask God for His grace to help us move on. God wants to, God wants to release you from the guilt feeling today. Ask for God's grace to help us to move on. And don't give up on your children. Continue to pray for their salvation. And as a church, let's be a people that will take God seriously, that take our faith seriously. Let's live out our faith in such a way whereby when the next generation looks at us, when our children look at us, they can see how real God is to us. Let's influence and inspire the next generation towards Christ and build a strong foundation in them that can sustain them through their life. With that, may I just invite all of us to put aside our things. Let's rise on our feet as I invite the worship team to lead us in a time of worship as we prepare to respond to God this morning. This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you.
yes, Lord, we want to give you our heart today. You are that awesome God that deserve our worship, that deserve our praise. And today, help us, O oh Lord, to commit our life to you once again. Because you are such a wonderful God. Thank you, Jesus. As all heads are bowed, all eyes are closed, I believe God is challenging us today to recommit our lives to Him, to take Him seriously. Before we can even talk about passing on our faith to the next generation, we need to ensure that we have a genuine faith to pass on to them. It's not just about just coming to church week in and week out, but it's, about, it's really about having a relationship with Jesus whereby we want to obey Him, whereby we want to live out our faith in our daily lives, every day of our life, not just on Sundays, not just on live group days. And God is challenging us to take our faith seriously, to take Him seriously. And today, if this is you, you want to commit your life to God, you want to tell God that, God, I want to take you seriously. Help me to live out a genuine faith Help me to obey everything in your word. If this is you, I'd like you to raise your hand. And when I see your hand, I want to take time to pray together with you. If this is you, you'd like to commit your heart to Jesus once again and say, Yes, Lord, I repent of the times that I have not taken you seriously. But today, I want to commit my life to you once again. I want to take you seriously. I no longer want to just take you casually but I want to fear you. Help me to develop a lifelong fear of you. If this is you, just raise your hand right now. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we pray for all my brothers and sisters who are raising their hands to you. Lord, today we are committing to, to you once again that we want to give our life to you. We want to live our life for you, O Lord. We repent of the times, O oh Lord, that we have not taken you seriously. We have not taken your word seriously. And we ask that God help us to have a genuine faith. Help us, O oh Lord, to live our life in such a way whereby we can make a strong impact on the next generation. That when they look at our lives, they will be able to see that you are indeed real in our lives, O oh Lord. You are indeed a God who is true. You are indeed a God who is real. You are a God who will never leave us nor forsake us. Help us, O oh Lord, to hold on to You. Help us, O oh God, to hold on to Your promises. Help us, O oh God, to obey You even in the challenging seasons of our life, O oh Lord. That even as we do that, we will be a testimony and an inspiration to the next generation. Lord, we thank You and we pray all this in Jesus' name. And today, I also want to take time to pray for parents whose children have left the faith. If this is you, I would like you to just raise your hands so that I can pray for you. If your children have already left the faith, just raise your hands. I want to pray and minister to you right now. Father, you know us, you know our children, you love us, and you love our children. Oh, I want to pray for all my brothers and sisters whose children have left the faith. Lord, even though it's painful to us, it is even more painful for you. And I pray, O oh Lord, that the seed of faith that was planted in their hearts will remain strong, will not be lost, and I pray for the Holy Spirit to stir in their hearts, to work in their hearts, O Lord, that You will give them a heart of flesh, take away their heart of stone, give them a heart of flesh that is capable of responding to You, O Lord. And Lord, I pray that You stir in their hearts wherever they are right now, stir in their hearts, O Lord, a desire to want to seek You, a desire to want to know You, because Your Word tells us that even as we seek You with all our heart, You will be found by us. And I pray right now, there is no place too far that the Holy Spirit cannot touch. You know where these children are? 
Holy Spirit, go forth and touch their hearts right now. Bring them back to you. Draw them back to you, O Lord, because, Lord, we know that you love them very much, much more than we can love them. And we cry out for them. We cry out for their salvation, O Lord. May you turn their hearts towards you once again so that they are able to enjoy this abundant life that you have promised. Thank you, O Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All his bow, all eyes closed, no one looking around. The final group of people that I want to speak to, you are someone who have not known Jesus yet. You may have a Christian name, you may have come from a Christian school, but the truth about you is you never have a relationship with Jesus. And today, you hear about this abundant life that Jesus has come to give us. And today, right here, right now, in this moment, when you place your trust in Jesus and decide to follow Him, you can experience this abundant life. And today, Jesus is inviting you to come and know Him, to experience this abundant life that He has come to provide for you. If this is your desire, I would like to lead you to say a prayer. This prayer expresses our desire to want to know Jesus, to want to come to know this abundant life that He promised. So if this is you, I want to invite you to pray this prayer together with me. Are you ready? Yes. Say, Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner. I confess that I'm a sinner. And I want to thank you. And I want to thank you for dying on the cross. For dying on the cross. For my sins. For my sins. Right now. Right now. I invite you. I invite you to come into my life. To come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Be my Savior. Help me to become. Help me to become. The kind of person. The kind of person. I was created to I be. I was created to be. And I pray all this. I pray all this. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And all God's people shall say. Amen. 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 Amen.